I think it's really, for me as of late, it's more about modeling my behavior and making sure that everything that I ask of them is something that I'm doing myself. And it's not always easy to do. We can't always be in that mode where we're going to be, you know, follow my lead type of situation there. I mean, we have to be present and we have to be really persistent, making sure that you can't let them stray away too, too far. But I think lately it's consumed me. It's something that it's my greatest responsibility, you know, career or everything else aside, you know, this is one job that I cannot fail. And sometimes you put yourself in a situation where you compromise yourself a lot because of that. And you can't do that either. Hey, I'm Jade Ellison, a multi-passionate creative based out of New York City who's obsessed with personal development and anything business from marketing, branding, creating online programs to launches and helping you step into your true self so that you can share your gifts with the world. Gain insights with manifesting, creating life on purpose and get ready to elevate yourself in ways that will surprise even you. Included in your weekly dose of inspiration, get ready to be entertained, uplifted, and encouraged to take action with simple and easy to apply tips, tools, and strategies that fit into your busy daily life, sprinkled with some woo-woo along the way. From embracing your confidence to mastering success habits, setting achievable goals, and ways to harness positive mindsets and beliefs so that you can kick self-doubt and your inner critic to the curb where they belong. Whatever's on the topic call sheet, I'll help you navigate the raw, messy, and sometimes hilarious truths of achieving success, abundance, and happiness, all while encouraging you to become the best version of yourself. So think of me as your go-to girlfriend, talking over some coffee, getting real, and giving you some amazing advice to go from hot mess to thriving success. This is the Uber Savvy Life and Biz Podcast. Hey, welcome back to the Uber Savvy Life and Biz Podcast, where together we'll unlock your true potential to design the life and business of your dreams. I'm your host, Jade Ellison, and today is a super special episode because we have my very good friend, Berto Colon, a New York-based professional actor, and his most recent work is the recurring role of Castillo in the upcoming DC HBO Max series, Penguin, aka Boss, starring Colin Farrell. He's perhaps best known for playing the roles of Lorenzo Tejada in the star series Power Book 2, Ghost, opposite Mary J. Blige, and Caesar in the Netflix hit series Orange is the New Black. He could also be seen in Ava DuVernay's Netflix limited series When They See Us, and in David Simon's HBO miniseries Show Me a Hero with Oscar Isaac. On the film side, he stars in Rosalind Sanchez's directorial debut Satos, in Cyan Hedder's film, Tallulah, with Elliot Page, Uzo Abuda, and Zach Quinto. He co-stars in indie films such as Inside Game with Will Sasso and Scott Wolf, and stars alongside Levin Rambin in the indie film, Alpha Beta. He has previously guest starred on The Equalizer, Chicago PD, Conviction, NCIS New Orleans, and The Tick for Amazon. Other credits include The Blacklist, Gotham, Blue Bloods, and Madam Secretary. But before jumping into the episode, if you would like weekly inspiration and would like to stay updated when I release new episodes and have incredible guests like Berto, check out jadeellison.com and sign up for the VIP Insider List, where you'll get access to your Empowered Morning Mindset Checklist, an awesome download you'll get completely free just for signing up, which will give you your ultimate caffeine-free boost to supercharge your mornings for success. So, Berto. Hey. (laughs) Berto, it is so awesome to have you on the show. I am so thankful that you took time out of your day to be here. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. It was so nice to get to know you when we did this most recent commercial that we did together. And the second you told me, and the second I saw you working as hard as you were working on prepping this, and the second we got to know each other, I figured, you know, I would love to join you. So here I am. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Would you like to share? I mean, I guess we could share a little bit about the commercial that we worked on. That's the first time I've met you in the journey of being in the city over 13 years working as a professional actor. How long have you been working? I mean, my first job started, it was 2002. Wow. But I've been at it for a while. Graduated in 97. So I think right around the time that I was about to get out of college, I started to kind of venture out and hit the pavement, as they say, looking for not only an acting job, but also work in the city so that I could provide a way to 
some type of income earning ability in the city while I was pursuing acting. So yeah, I guess, yeah, it's probably closer to 25, 26 years. That's amazing. Yeah. It's a very long time. So cool. So cool. So Berto and I worked recently. We were filming a commercial in Detroit and it was a multi-day spot for an awesome car commercial, which should be coming out during the holidays. Yeah. It's a holiday theme. We can't really say the brand, right? I guess. I would say until it comes out, but it will be obvious because we have a family. It's around Christmas time. So it was you and I. Yes. It was a family setting, introducing a new model of an electric type. Yes. An EV, among other models, but uh, really, really fun shoot. And obviously, you know, these things. I wish that as a commercial actor, I did more work on these. And this one actually had a really nice theme. Obviously, the family theme, the coming home family, you know, the Christmas coming home theme. And it was a lot of fun to shoot. Great crew. And it was a lot of fun to shoot something like this. Felt like a, a mini episode of a little episodic, you know, it was pretty cool. A hundred percent. So for those of you tuning in, if you're like, what in the world are you talking about? So basically the difference between a commercial shoot and a series shoot are obviously the budget, but it also has to do with the amount of people on set, the crew. I feel even for the commercial that we had, there must have been 80 to 100 people working, which was pretty incredible. It was quite a big, you can tell, I mean, this is a big one. This was a pretty, not a massive, but it was a pretty good size commercial. I'm assuming a very good budget. So with regards to commercials, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is probably one of the bigger ones that I've been on. But with, you know, the comparison to like a series or like an episodic television shoot, I mean, obviously that's a lot more involved. And Absolutely. A lot more people. The, the vibe was great and everyone was professional and obviously everyone there had worked on TV and it was obvious that people had a lot of experience. Yeah, it definitely felt like that. We played hubby and wife. At first, I thought we had just two kids and then we had three. And <laughs> Yeah, I guess if we ran, if we were doing an episodic, we would have had a little bit more background story and a fuller script to be able to Absolutely. assess, you know, the size of the family that we had. But yeah, so things like that, it was, those are nice little discoveries that I guess helped us in the moment to kind of you know, play in the moment. For sure. So when we met on set, one of the things that you had mentioned too, before even starting your acting journey, was that you were playing sports. Yes. Football specifically. Yeah. So to take you back a little bit, I grew up in Puerto Rico and growing up in Puerto Rico, I was, sports has been a typical part of my development, you know, child with a lot of energy. I was always moving around a little bit hyperactive, I guess you can say. And that's always been the case for me. And sports was a fantastic way to channel all that energy. I mean, I just don't know anything other than that, you know. In fact, now that I have kids, I realized how important that was in my own. But it started out with this idea that while I was, you know, as I got to high school, I was watching this show on ESPN called Scholastic Sports America. And it was a weekly TV show that highlighted high school students and what they were doing and where they were heading. And it was sort of like the beginning of planting that seed that I kind of wanted to follow in the same, you know, realizing that perhaps it was a way for me to get an education through sports was a realization really early on, knowing that perhaps, you know, my parents would not be able to go forward, something like that. And I had big aspirations to come to the States anyway. My mom was already a nurse here. My parents divorced early in my elementary school years and mom was already here. So I went from swimming to basketball and then I discovered football and it was all she wrote at that point. In Puerto Rico, you can really, it wasn't as big of a sport in Puerto Rico, but there was one particular place where they had this league and it was a place called Fort McCannon, which is one of our military bases in San Juan. Me. And the league, you know, the league was a prominent league, the only league. And so I started playing in that league and playing there and watching that show kind of led me to believe that if I was in the States, it would probably be a lot easier to get some recognition and be seen by the big colleges. So my aspirations were at that point to get to do high school in the States and my mom was already in New York. So that was the goal. I set it and I achieved it. That's how I won. You know, I got here, repeated the eighth grade, and then I went on to high school and then high school is when I really got focused and got a scholarship eventually to go to Fordham University. You got a scholarship to Fordham University? 
to Fordham University to play football there, yeah. And it was one of the last schools that recruited me. I was actually being recruited by Colgate as well, I remember, in Southern Connecticut State. Amazing. But I decided on Fordham and I, it was sort of like, I was really the only local kid because a lot of times people go away for college for the most part. And not a lot of people choose to stay home for college, but it was, you know, arguably the best choice for me at the time. I mean, it was a D1 school, Patriot League, and it was also, I mean, higher learning institution. I mean, it's Fordham University. Absolutely. Like almost Ivy League. Definitely. So that was the choice. And then graduated in 97 and I had some ideas about this work, but I sort of dabbled in it first while I was attempting to do other things until I uh, got a little bit more serious with this. So I love that. So can you just like kind of, do you remember at what point, because you said eighth grade, you came here to live with your mom. So your mom was already here when you were in elementary school. Do you remember? Yeah. So my parents were divorced and it was right around, you know, sixth, seventh and eighth grade. Intermediate school was a bit of a... Like middle school. Like middle school was the years that mom came here. She established herself in the state. She had been working as a nurse. She was, first of all, working at the hospital, a private hospital in my town where we grew up, which is Ponce, the south side of the island. She eventually landed a job at Veterans Hospital in San Juan. So then she moved to San Juan for a little while. And then after that, she decided to try her chances here. And she basically, I mean, as the story goes, essentially, she had an idea and a connection, but she had no lined up interview or anything like that. So she essentially came here as they always say, a couple of thousand dollars in her bank account and just winged it. I mean, it's not exactly, it was a chance, there was a risk because there was no interview set up, but she had already worked in Puerto Rico. And so when she came here and applied, I guess she went through the normal application process, but connected with someone very early and already had the resume. And it's the same institution. It's the same hospital. It's a U.S. hospital in in the island. Oh, that's great. Right. Just like how different hospitals have. It was a veterans hospital. Right. It was veterans hospital in Puerto Rico. And so she had that. And so that helped her kind of catapulted her, I guess, to maybe a a higher place in some list, if you will. But she eventually got in and got seen and interviewed with the right people and got the job. You know, it took her little time to get, you know, maybe a year or so to get settled. And then, you know, was proposed and sort of it was all these things were happening for her as I was kind of developing and evolving my ideas about wanting to come here. And, you know, when she was here and she was settled and she had her apartment and she had everything going, she asked if we wanted to come. So we did. I love that. I love that. And you're the oldest of four brothers? I'm the oldest of four. At the time, the little guy hadn't been born yet, but I'm the oldest of four. And then I think the way it went is that we all came here. We gave it a shot. We gave it a shot here for two years. And then the youngest one went back. And then I stayed here with the middle guy. And we sort of split the boys up. And two of us were here. One was there. and saw each other in the summers and Christmas. But that, for the most part, that's the way it went. Cool. And so, first of all, that's like super impressive that you had that mindset from such a young age, like that developmental time in our life in middle school. And you knew just from feeling that inspiration of watching that, what was it called? The ESPN Scholastic? Scholastic Sports America. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I was just into sports a lot. I think, you know, like I said, it was just the transition, having to come to a new place, the whole idea of the expectations and what it would require at the very least was some type of preparation and focus because I was going to go somewhere that I didn't know. I mean, it was kind of taking me out of my comfort zone, my friends and everything that I knew and kind of focusing on a higher purpose and that it's hard to imagine or it's hard to put myself back in that mindset of this younger kid. But I know that there was a lot of Fear will make you do, you know, channeling your fears will make you do certain things. And, you know, this is not a fear of the unknown, but it's also knowing that the outlook for something like that, you're sacrificing for something unknown, but you know that your sacrifice can pay off because you're working towards something meaningful, something, a higher goal, bettering yourself. You know, my mom was here. She had already made that sacrifice. So I had that as an example. And my father was also working real hard over there to maintain and keep us going. You know, he kept us busy and he was doing a lot of different things. I mean, I just never had, you know, my grandmother lived with us. My father's mom kind of raised us as well over there. And she was this 
I call her a saint. I had two of them. I had both my mother's mom and my father's mom were both very special religious, spiritual people. And they were just super influential in making us understand that, you know, I was kind of a crazy kid and there was always the conversation. It's like, listen, you know, your mom and dad, they sacrifice a lot. You know, your mom and dad, they sacrifice a lot. You know, you got to behave, you got to respect that, you got to honor that. So that was always a theme. That was a common theme for me. And so, yeah, I'm proud of my old, I'm proud of myself. I made some good choices. Absolutely. For you to have such a strong mindset then, and because of the influence of your grandmothers? Grandmothers and both mom and dad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And as the oldest, you always had to shine for the younger brothers. You know, it was always, they were not shy about making me understand that was a burden that I had to bear, right? As the older, you've got a trailblaze and they're looking up to you. So you got to live up to that standard, all that stuff. And you absolutely did. You did trailblaze. I mean, even just to have a scholarship for football yeah. at Fordham University in New York City, even though it felt to you at the time that you were staying local and staying home. I mean, that's a dream that other people, the other guys, the other gals from other parts of the country were looking to achieve, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's a good goal, I think. I mean, I'm struggling with it now so much because I think that now that as a father, it's like you want to set standards and you want to teach your kids. I just feel like nowadays the attention that they have and the maturity level is just not there yet. You know, they're so distracted with everything else, but that would be a whole other podcast that I'm not going to get into. The whole other podcast about how electronics are taking over our youth. <laughs> oh, God, it's so corrupting, but yeah. I feel like you're doing a great job though, because- Thank you, thank you, Jay. You really are. I mean, so when we worked on set for the shoot for the commercial, there's some downtime. So we talk, we share things that matter. And I would say that a lot of the conversation that really mattered a lot to you that I picked up on was how much of a positive influence that you want to be as a father to your girls and how shaping their mindsets now really matter to you. And this is the first time I'm hearing his story from when you were a young guy in Puerto Rico and then being influenced by your mother and father and your grandmothers. I'm not surprised that it really has that impact on you to want to make that positive influence on your daughters now. But you're doing a great job because I know that they're both, are they both in private school and in sport? Yeah. So one is in private, one is in public. They're both very involved and they're doing great. They have their normal, you know, their normal moments, teenagers, 14 and 15, sophomores and freshmen that, you know, that are challenging and difficult, you know. That's a fun age to be challenging and difficult as young girls. Yeah. I mean, you heard me say it over and over, right? I mean, I'm competing with a lot of different elements of influence, especially in their worlds. You know, their social world is so important to them, you know. And I guess to sum it all up, it's just a matter of being able to have them understand what the importance to prioritize each of those and how important each of those levels are and to their daily routine, their daily lives, their daily aspects, you know, the aspects of their daily lives, how important every one of those is and you know to be able to set them in the right order absolutely and even to just balance out their activities now because the youngest is doing great she's competing in cheer yeah she's competing in cheer and then the oldest is uh doing basketball amazing which she kind of comes in and out of a little bit okay because she's it's hard i know it's hard and it's a lot to ask because it requires a lot of sacrifice. And I think one of the things that gets in the way is, you know, the amount of sacrifice and the amount of time that you put into all these things outside of their social world, right? Unless you have the love for it, it doesn't really quite pay off as much as it used to when she was perhaps younger, like maybe seventh and eighth grade. But I mean, listen to this crazy conversation. We're talking about kids who are like 13, 14, and 15. You know, it's, it's hard. It's hard. You put a lot of pressure on them, but because I know the reward. Absolutely. Absolutely. And because you got a scholarship from being persistent. Yeah. And the persistence pays off. And look, it's not like you can't have a social life. It's not like I'm trying to get in the way of any of these experiences. And sometimes they're not the greatest experiences. I understand you have to have those, but the payoff and, you know, what would be more meaningful when you look back at your years, you know, five, six, four years from now, you're always going to wish that you did certain things different. And that's the part that I get locked in on. You have to push, you know, I've never met anyone that's, you know, in their twenties or in their thirties who doesn't say that they wish they would have had someone to push them in a certain direction. 
And I mean, that's 85% of the conversations that I've had. There's never anyone that says, oh, you know, I wish I would have stopped playing this game sooner because it ruined my life. Or I wish I would have, you know, because more than likely you stopped doing this activity because you were consumed by something that filled you a lot in that moment. You gravitated towards it. It was social. It was exciting. It was whatever it was, but it was something that you could have gone without. And at the end of the day, you know, having friends and doing all that, you know how that is when you're a kid. It's like the end of the world. Meanwhile, you look back on that and it's like, how many people have you had in your life who you are not even in contact with anymore? You know, so it's one of those things. It's hard to balance that as a parent. Absolutely. I could see that for sure. And I have a lot of friends who go through that as well with their kids, all different ages. And I've seen that with my nephews. Yeah. And it's really just keeping like what you said, that persistence and that intention and attention on the values that you personally have for yourself, which have been so embedded into you from growing up with your incredible family. So at what point in college did you start playing with acting? Because I think that's a really cool transition that you took from going in and playing college football. What position were you in also for those of you listening in who love football? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was pretty good in high school. And one thing I left out is that I actually got hurt my senior year of high school. So I suffered a knee injury that kind of ended my senior year in high school. Um, but I had already gained enough. Thank God I had already had good experience. I actually played as a sophomore in varsity. So I got moved up pretty quickly. You know, I didn't exactly get big fast, but I was fast and I was pretty strong for my size. So I played defense. I was more prolific in defense. And I also played running back. A lot of kids go both ways, as they call it, in high school. And I think that I got recruited pretty much with that, you know, kind of a little bit of a question mark because I had good accolades on both sides of the ball. And, you know... I guess speaks volumes about the opportunity itself because without a senior year, you know, I sort of had done enough my junior and my sophomore year to get a scholarship and to get recruited. Incredible. And so my career started in offense in college. And then towards the end, I ended up in defense. And in hindsight, again, life experience, I wish I would have focused more on defense because I was a lot more, I love the physical aspect of the game. I used to look to hit people not something you want to do when you play offense. It's a good mentality to have in the early part of a career in football, like say when you're, you know, maybe playing peewee. Or, but when you get to high school, the point is, as a running back, you don't want to get hit. You don't want to get caught. But I would never shy away from contact. And so that and having a good nose and having good reaction to the ball is very important. You, know, you study plays and you study schemes and certain Things about defense all really come down to the ability to react and improvise in a moment and just have a, a nose for the ball and speed. So I wish I would have kind of stayed on defense more. But, you know, it was interesting because I already had an injury. Okay. Right? And so... Were you still playing with the injury? So I got over it. I'd rehab. I had my surgeries. I'd rehab. And then I got hurt again. Oh, no. And as a freshman, I had these injuries that were kind of making me think rethink, you know, because the idea was to go pro. The idea was to like become pro. And, wow, you know, I was not exactly in a very prominent school for, you know, for that. I mean, it was division one, but it was just division one AA at the time. And I wasn't exactly a star. I wasn't exactly, you know, I wasn't exactly crushing it as I did in high school. And so that kind of situation, realizing that perhaps, you know, this is the last year, last two, three years that you've been doing this. My interests were always there. Because of my injury, I had gotten into college as a registered recruit, which meant that I still had four years of eligibility. And so I was going to have the extra time. So I figured, let me load up with courses, you know, let me load up with these art courses and film class and acting and script writing. Fordham University in the Bronx, it's a liberal arts school and a CBA school. The good theater department, I guess you would say, is in the city. So I never actually came to Lincoln Center campus for any classes there. So I just mainly focus on some peripheral arts, directing, all of these other, whatever I can kind of latch onto and fit into my curriculum, especially in my last three semesters of school. That's cool. So it was almost like a double major. But because of those injuries, kind of knowing where I was heading, 
it's what started to kind of what allowed my interest to grow a little bit more. And then also at the time, one of my best friends who I consider a brother, I mean, he's the godfather of my oldest. He was at SUNY Purchase and he was studying directing. And so I got involved with his works. I shot my own little film, my first semester of my senior year or second or third quarter. Was it a short film? I did my own shorts. Yeah, I did all that stuff. And after that, it's kind of like where it really like, I mean, I was fixated on from figuring this out once I got out of school. It really started then. So your focus and your interest really started having that pull later in college. Yeah. So it, it would be junior and senior year. And then that extra year was really the focus. So I mean, I did other people's shorts. I was going into the city. I was still looking through the voice. Nice. <laughs> and finding little jobs in the city. And I would look for, I did small plays. I got involved in, you know, small NYU, like student films, like for no money or just to shoot for the day. And so you start dabbling in the work a little, and then you start doing your own. And then you figure, hey, you know, if I'm going to go out there, I got to study. And then you figure out a way to study. With, I got a few different teachers before I landed on the one that I give credit to most. His name was Robert Patterson. He actually had an actual studio that I went to and matriculated with him for a good two and a half, three years. So it's such a crazy journey, Jay, because I mean, no, no one's story is the same, but it all involves a lot of diving into this world a lot of times without much guidance and kind of finding your own way, you know, discovering what's going to make you better and how you can continue to pursue your, the work and at the same time trying to get an aid in and figuring out what's, in, you know, uh, maybe get into the soaps and then the manager and then after the soaps and I get into TV, it's just such a, there's no direct path in how one pursues this work and this career. It's different for everybody. And so it's a matter of kind of just diving into these situations, like, yeah. you know, looking for a small play to become a part of, looking for small ensembles, theater companies. And keeping that vision of an ideal yeah, and keeping your mind that having your mind power and being persistent and persevering through the ups and downs as any acting career or any creative career, those ups and downs come with. So at what point was the, wow, this is happening? Was it when you had that first soap? Do you know that it's crazy because you're just, God, you're just going through it. And I guess, you know, the journey I was always persistent and I was always trying to make sure that I was growing in some way. I was always working on the side, doing something else, probably bartending, right? But it wasn't until I would say towards the latter part of, I think I did all my children and, and a few smaller soaps. And then I got a couple of small TV roles. So the early 2000s was little work here and there like that, like little, I don't know if I can say on the fives, but it was like co-stars and I did like maybe five or six different soaps. And then like it started to kind of pick up a little momentum. And then I got into TV. And that was all in New York? The soaps? That was all in New York. All the ones in New York. So I sort of made my way around all of them here. And then slowly but surely, a couple of little TV spots here and there. And then I think it wasn't until Orange. Like I had already done some television. Like I had already done, I think I was doing elementary. There was a couple of smaller shows that I did. Just like literally like a one day deals and one day guest stars or one day co-stars. And then this thing with Orange hit. Please jump into, I would love, I'm sure our listeners would love to hear about what transpired with Orange is the New Black. Yeah. So the crazy thing about that, it was the beginning of the whole, you know, streaming. No one really knew what was going on. I just knew that this was another regular audition for a show that was now going to be on a new platform called Netflix. And I was like, Netflix, you didn't the company that I get the floppy disks and CDs from every month or every week. So it was all a very new idea, but for an actor, it's not like I'd been anywhere significant before where I've been employed, you know, for let's say three months or five months. I wasn't a series regular, the beginning of something new, but it felt like just another regular audition. And I just went in the same way, you know, and a week later you're hired. And so it started off as the same kind of deal, like a one day or a one episode co-star. No way. And it grew from there. I didn't have a, let's say, a set amount of episodes in that first season. It was literally, I went in for this one and they called again for the second time. And then they called again and they sort of, you know, as the scripts were being written, because I mean, I'm sure they approved the pilot and maybe they had 
some structure, maybe five, six episodes written. As all the other episodes got written out, they kept adding Thazar into the mix. And so that's awesome. That's how it all kind of, after that platform, everything sort of started picking up. You know, it wasn't just season one. All told, it was like 10 episodes over the course of seven seasons. And his storyline, as you know, is very intricate because he's involved with one of the series regular moms who happens to have a daughter who's also a series regular. And then when the mom goes to jail, he gets involved with the daughter. And then she gets in trouble because she's running his drugs. And when she goes to jail, he finds a new one. I remember all of this story plot. Yeah. And they, a lot of his stuff, a lot of the plot for him was flashback with both the mom, Aleda and Dasha, and Daya, which was her name, Dasha Polanco and, and Elizabeth Rodriguez. I mean, it was amazing. It was amazing. It just kept evolving from there. And since Orange, a lot of things have picked up. You know, I mean, that show was such a worldwide phenomenon at the time. And, you know, I didn't exactly play in every episode, but I think the work was well received and he was an interesting character. And you really stood out every time that you came back. I remember thinking like, whoa, they brought him back. That's awesome. And yeah. then you'd come back again and you had thank you. You have this really powerful very grounded charisma when you're on camera and when you're on screen, when you're in your characters, even working with you on set, it's very easy for you to just drop into your character. Thank you. Likewise. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. It means a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And those moments before, like right after they call action, like you just getting centered within yourself and then expressing your character through you. It feels like it's really easy for you to just kind of go with the ebb and flow of the different energies of your characters. And I remember you saying something on set. You're like, I always play the bad guy. I want to play the nice guy. And you're so <laughs> funny. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're so funny. And it would be great to see you on a comedy because it's kind of like the like a new I wanted to say like a new twist of a modern family style show where like I could see you on that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That means a lot. I, I mean, I do feel like. I owe a lot of that to the process and that I learned and understanding what this work is all about and really living in a space. You know, that's, I guess I can sum it up by saying that Mr. Robert Patterson, who, rest in peace, you know, was one of the last students that actually was actually in the flesh in the state, in New York, that actually had spent time with Sandy in a room. And he was one of the last living- Sandy Meisner. Pupils that actually, right. And the fact that I found them was just sheer crazy luck. I'm getting like major goosebumps. I studied Meisner. That's my acting technique as well, so. Yeah. And he was one of the living who lived and studied and was in that actor studio and was with Sandy in those, you know, epic, epic years of, this modern day acting that we talk about, especially here in New York, you know, with all the theater that's available to us and all the teachers that are available to us here. They're good teachers, grounded people that really know this craft. And so it's great to live in a space and that, that's the thrill. That's what I look for. But it would be nice to start, and it's coming. I feel like it's coming to start doing more because I think that the range and I think that what I can bring is a lot more diverse and there's a lot more there. So I'm just amped and, you know, I'm sitting on about three or four different scripts that I'm lucky enough to have friends who are great writers and have thought of me throughout this whole, you know, all these years in my own development, they've been developing too. And I'm lucky that they think that I'm good enough to portray some of the roles that they've written for me specifically. And so they're all very good, very, and I'm excited to hopefully bring those to, to life one day. That's awesome. And I hope that you get to bring those to life someday. I absolutely love this journey that you've been on and it feels like you're still going yeah. you're not just at the edge you're about to continue to fly if that makes any sense yeah and i want to jump into more of the current work that you're doing and that potential work that you're moving into in just a moment and that brings us to the middle of the episode if you are enjoying this episode if you could share it with three friends who you feel would love the topics discussed today and the incredible guests that we have that would be amazing because you never know who you could uplift. And if you could also give it five stars on whatever podcast listening app that you're on, it truly helps get the show in front of more like-minded listeners like yourself. And if you would love to see more of Berto Cologne's work, make sure you check out the show notes to stay up to date on his recent projects and any new projects that may be coming out. 
So that's super exciting working on Orange is the New Black. I feel like that's probably the best way to get a recurring role, getting the co-star and then just doing your thing, showing up to set, bringing your best, and then kind of forgetting about it and then moving on and then getting that call. So that obviously brought you other roles from that. What was the next thing that you went into that kind of like shifted how you were showing up for prepping for your roles, if that makes any sense? Yeah. So because of the intricacies about that work on Orange was that I essentially had no storyline. I was only given a few pages here and there. And as it evolved for me, I got to know more people on the cast. I obviously had a great relationship with Aleda and Dasha or Daya character names, but you know, Elizabeth and Dasha. And I just wanted to figure out and learn more. And so, you know, I had actually worked nightlife with Jackie Cruz. She was actually a server. I was a bartender at Lalo. And so between the three of them and more people that I got to know, you know, I sort of got a little bit more into the story and my preparation became a little bit fuller once I knew that I was, first of all, creating a real through line for who this guy was before, in that moment, and then after. So important. And that's how I would evolve from that show into the next. And then I would say, you know, the work that I did on When They See Us, even though it was short, even though the auditioning, I should say, I should preface that by saying that after Orange, my auditioning process completely changed. And I was going into much bigger rooms. You're not necessarily booking everything, but I felt like I was growing because I was going into much deeper, much bigger rooms for much bigger jobs. You know, I had gone close to booking real shows like pilot shows that didn't work out, but I was, you know, consistently year after year and season after season, a year and a half or two going in for those big pilots for the network. And then that kind of opens the way for you to be better prepared and more seasoned for the next one and then the next one. And so when I got the role for When They See Us, I felt ready to step into something like that because that role was so, he was a very ugly person. And I knew that story. The story of the Central Park Five to me was very personal because I had just moved to the States when that story was happening. And I remember vividly the sentiments of everyone around me, not just, you know, my mom remarried here and I had my stepfather had his feelings about those kids. I remember other people in the neighborhood talking about those kids. I remember how they just persecuted these kids and you don't know the story. You're just, you know, the general public is just hearing and being fed the news and you don't know the intricacies of a story like that. It wasn't until obviously later when all the details came out that we knew what really went on and how those kids got persecuted the way they did and falsely imprisoned, really. It's horrible. So for me, it was being able to understand the levity and the intensity of these roles and because they're real, it's a true story. I just felt like I graduated into a whole new world. As an actor, I felt like I can kind of step in. I had the confidence to not only going up for these jobs, but step into those roles and making those jobs what they were. Like, I mean, it's an opportunity. It's, you know, you got, you owe respect to not just the story, but the writers and everyone involved. And so that was really when things started to take off for me. And then it was doing a series in Puerto Rico briefly because the Show Me a Hero series that I did with David Simon, that was actually kind of like closing a pull circle for me because even though in the story it was uh, supposed to be the Dominican Republic, they shot that in Puerto Rico. No way. So I got to go back to the homeland and I got to go have my father come stay with me. It was my father, my brother, myself, and David Simon in a whirlpool at the El San Juan Hotel on the last night of the shoot. Like, it was just so crazy how you just, not just being in the, in the shoot and working and having that and kind of transforming myself. I grew a beard, I dyed my facial hair blonde. You know, I did that to replicate an experience I had years before when I did go to Dominican Republic of these kids down there because they thought that was a cool thing to do, like to dye their hair. Like there was like these black kids, like they were like the, the guys who would take care of the catamarans and all the work in the beach, like they dyed their hairs. And I just didn't understand what they were doing. Like these yeah. beautiful mulatto, dark skin, big guys. And I'm like, why would you dye your hair? It's a thing to do. It was just a thing to do. It's just a thing to do. 
It's just like the sun in back in the days when I was high school. It's like, why would you dye your hair? You know, the sun in. It was just a thing to do. And so I remember that. And it just slowly but surely, all these little things kind of started to come together. Your dad must have been so proud. And, you know, I know he was so proud for a lot of your accomplishments, but just to even witness that, I feel like that's a turning point for a lot of parents in the industry when they get to actually witness what their child has grown to become, you know? Yeah, what they achieved and to see them actually working. Yeah, it was a good moment for everyone there. And especially for me, I brought a lot of things. You know, I always say, Jay, that I've always lived to make them both proud. You know, even as a grown man, even as a grown adult, I've always, you owe that to them, you know, when you understand the sacrifice. So yes, it was a time of our lives that we will never forget. And it was... Like I said, I closed the big circle. I actually got to go back to Puerto Rico and work in all those years. Like, you know, he left the country to go do this. And now he's actually coming back here to do more work. So it was great. It was fantastic to do that. And to have my brother there as well was just, you know, kind of icing on the cake. That's incredible. Putting all that stuff together, you're just in a much more secure place. So then you can go out and actually do your best work when you have the confidence to actually do it. When you start believing in yourself more. Absolutely. Things lined up. Things really just began to, and they just continued to line up. I get a lot. I got my agents, I have my manager representation solid, all those details and all those aspects of my career are now solid. That in turn made it possible for me to go into much bigger rooms. I ended up booking a pilot, which we actually shot in Canada. So I got to go work in Canada, the trustee. Yeah, that's right. And was that before or after the world closed? That was 2017. That was 2017. And that, so that was your first pilot that in 2017? 2017, that was the first pilot. And that actually, we shot it. It was there. Michael Cutlitz, Laverne Cox was the lead in the show. And it was, you know, it was amazing. I mean, it was, you know, I spent a week in, oh my goodness, not Toronto, but- Montreal? No, Montreal, the West Coast. The West British Columbia. No, no, no. No, I'm messing it all up. No, it's my God. Vancouver. It's the West. Vancouver. Thank you. Thank you. Got to spend a month out in Vancouver. Nice. You know, a month and a half. Did you find yourself talking like Canadians? I have so many. Not Canadian at all. Friends. Not at no? all. But I found myself wishing that I could move to Canada because let me tell you, I still think Canada. I mean, I'm, what a place. I mean, I've been to Toronto now three or four times for work. And I've been there and I would love, so easy for us here in New York, by the way, it's like a quick hour flight, but Canada has been good to me. And coming back from that experience, and then of course the pilot did not get picked up, but nonetheless, it's like I have now an actual record of, you know, being paid as a series regular. And so now you are sort of in a, you're at a different level, right? You have uh, comps as they call them in the real estate world. You know, you have comps that you can match. I love it. So. I was just stacking all my chips and I feel like I'm never going to be out of that mode of working and work begets work, as they say, but you always have to stack your chips and continue to build and grow in the last experience in the last job. And that's where I find myself now. And, you know, I, I was blessed to get hired for the power series ghost that really catapulted me into another level. I feel how was working with Mary J. Blige? It, you know, Mary J is a legend, you know? Yeah. And I think. I had a lot of, you know, insecurities. Naturally. I mean, she's like an icon. She's a total icon. But again, having had those experiences of all those years of stacking my chips, so to speak. And I mean, I've been hired for a pilot. I've worked on TV now. I can do this work. And after that pilot, I did get some subsequent work in other, you know, NCIS and I did Chicago PD and I did some other work. And so now like my face was after a little bit more, you have a body of work that gets you some type of, you know, you build some credibility. Yeah. And you build, and then the community and cast and production can sort of trust that and empower you to be part of their work. And, you know, you get opportunities from that. And it builds your confidence. It builds And your, it builds the confidence. And your security. Yeah. Knowing that you got this, like being on set, you built yourself up. You've worked enough. You've lived your life. Yeah. And now you're amongst people that, are effortless to play with. Otherwise you wouldn't be there. Yeah, exactly. And believing that is great. And so that's how I got over that quick, you know, I was nervous at first, but then it was time to go. And, you know, our relationship on that show was pretty contested. You know, we were, it was pretty heated. So that grounded me and that made me feel a lot at ease. And I just, I brought as much as she brought. So nice. it worked out well. You matched it. I mean, we matched it. And the experience helped to be prepared for something like that. And that's from the Meisner training. So for anybody who might 
be like, what in the heck is Meisner? There's different styles of acting training. There's method training, which is kind of like an old school style training. It's very valid. It's a very powerful style of training where method training, method actors really live in the moment and they have to pull up a lot of like old memories and old emotions to kind of get that emotional state, so to speak, and that energy into the character. Where with Meisner, it's present, it's reacting, it's action, reaction, it's cause and effect. It's literally like what you bring is what I bring. What you need me to match is what I'm going to match. Like it's more of a mirror. It's more natural and it's more real life. I feel there's a lot of validity in the method acting. And there's some actors who mix method with Meisner, but Berto trained via Robert Patterson, who worked directly with Sanford Meisner, which is incredible. I trained at William Esper, and that is a Meisner-based acting studio as well in New York City. So I love that you matched her energy. I think that's super cool, Yeah, especially because you went head to head with Mary J. Blige, which is awesome. Yeah, it's been an interesting road with her. And, you know, I'm so grateful because, you know, she's such a mega star. And I think it was a matter of us figuring out that we were equals in this moment here. And I think it played really great. I think it played really convincing and really great on camera. We definitely, we were in the service of that script and I think we did it a great service. Awesome. That's incredible. Who would you say surprised you when you met them and you got to learn more about them behind the scenes on set? Besides me, of course. Besides you on set. I mean, I think for me, one of the nicest surprises was uh, working with Method Man on that show. Nice. He is somebody that I admire and look up to. I'm proud that I can say that I'm actually, he's a friend. I call him a friend now. I love it. You know, the sensibilities of a guy like that are, I guess, most people would make certain assumptions about him. And little do they know what's really underneath all of that, right? It's so refreshing to meet someone who you don't think you have so many things in common with, but you do. You know, he's also a father. You know, he's a big dude, so he's always had an interest in, in his physicality is very present for him. He is of a very strong mindset. He's extremely talented linguistically and physically and in every way possible. I think the guy is, there's no bounds. There's no real limit to what a guy like that can do. And I mean, he's an idol. I mean, I grew up a big fan. Absolutely. For me, that was like one of the nicest surprises. It's just, you don't think that you can have so many things in common with somebody like that and that they'd be so welcoming of you, really. I mean, that's kind of like the way we think of stars. So that's cool. There was a lot of great, everyone on this set was, I said, working. It's, you know, we always talk about this family, you know, it was just really going to work with a bunch of like your brothers and sisters and cousins, you know, so really from not just the cast, crew, production, everyone was really I think I got spoiled somewhat. It's going to be very hard to find a set like that, for sure. That's amazing. And if you're all wondering which show that is, again, that's Power Book 2 Ghost, which Berto played opposite Mary J. Blige and also has the cast of Method Man and other incredible actors on there. And you can find that on Stars if you are subscribed to that network. That's incredible. What is Method Man's real name? Does he say? Clifford Smith. Is it really? Did you call him Method though? Like, how was that? I just call him Method. You call him Method? I just call him Method, yeah. That's cool. That's cool. I love it. Unless he tells me, call me Clifford from this point forward, but that's, I just call him Method, yeah. I love it. That's fantastic. So currently, what's your most exciting project that you yeah. are itching to get back to? <laughs> yes, because the project is on hold, unfortunately. But yeah, so I was really lucky to kind of transition right at the very end of Ghost, because my character meets his timely death, I booked a role in the new series Boss, which is originally called The Penguins, pretty much a spinoff from the DC Matt Reeves world of the Batman for HBO. They created a series for one of the villains, The Penguin, played by none other than Colin Farrell. Very cool. And if you haven't seen that movie, first of all, go back and see The Batman. And you'll find out why there is now a series, a spinoff for just the penguin, because he it is just visceral performance. First of all, he's in a complete body suit made of latex and rubber. And there's hair and the guy just, he is transformative enough just in his own skin. But the levels that transformation goes to when he puts on this suit, 
is just, it's again, he has transformed him enough. It's just now when you add the visual and the exceptional visuals of seeing somebody gain 70 pounds and it doesn't look like it's fake and his speech, you know, the evil that this guy is, the penguin and the sort of like the new spin on this villain who was sort of, you know, the penguin has never been a very, I don't know, I guess you would say, I've never viewed the penguin as he's, you know, small and kind of like squirmy. Right. He was a villain because he was definitely evil, but easily subdued. Like you can get him, you know, you cut off the parish, you know, you cut off, you figure out where umbrellas are at and you find them or whatever. Or if you take his umbrella away, his powers, he's read their top, right? Like he wouldn't really contest Batman in any way, physically. This guy is no joke. I mean, it was just so amazing to be able to be, and I got to go to work. And so my days are always with him and a bunch of other amazing people. Do you have to wear any costumes in that? No, not for me. He's the only one. Yeah, no costumes. I have to get HBO Max. Yeah, no, you got to. I think it's one of the better, you know, the, the programming is amazing on there. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Incredible. And depending when this episode airs, you might be already on set filming that. Yeah, <laughs> let, let's hope so. I mean, let's hope so. I mean, right now they have to get through filming and then hopefully we'll have a date for the debut. That's incredible. It must take four hours for him to get into his penguin suit. It's four to five hours every time he shows up to work. It's really intense. Insane. Yeah. And to be around it and to be in the presence of that, it's really insane. And he's still showing up in the makeup trailer, like to finish off, or he has his, I'm hoping he has. They set him up separately, you know, like he has his own kind of like separate production that goes on for him, you know, because right. he kind of shows up and it's, you know, four hours before, three hours after, or five before, three hours after. It takes three hours to get out of that outfit. I'm sure it takes a while to get out. Amazing. Yeah. It's, that's love. That's love. That's absolute love. Absolute love for the craft. Absolutely. You know, how big is your smile every time you have a early call and like you wake up at 3 a.m.? I don't think I ever complain when I have to wake up so early to be on set. Yeah, I know. There's never a complaint when it comes to that. I mean, my wife always makes fun of me because it's my goodness, you, how do you do that? You know, and it almost like we're just in such a high, right? I mean, three o'clock in the morning, we're driving or someone's picking us up and you don't sleep. I don't sleep. It's just like a whole day. That means that my day is going to be 16 hours, you know, and it doesn't feel like it at all. You know, no, there's so much energy and adrenaline. And that's what I love about being on set. I feel like everybody is so intricately masterful with their specific task, with their department, with their job. And mm -hmm. everybody's happy to be there from the grips to lighting, to sound, to hair and makeup. Absolutely. Catering, you know, crafty. That's what we call it on set. Crafty craft services. Yeah. We eat things that we don't even, that we wouldn't typically even eat at our own home, but it's there. <laughs> yeah. The fan, all the fancy snacks that we don't have in, in our own loops, we eat there. Yeah. Absolutely. So what would you say is an ideal for you with your acting? I know that you have some ideas for writing your own work and producing that. What would be something that you would love to come to fruition on this journey of acting and also being that positive influence as a father to your girls so that they can feel like they want to work towards something and bring that type of value that you've been bringing for all of these years. Yeah. I think for me, it would be to get on some, you know, first of all, to have the ability to create my own work and to get on some type of routine where I know the work was coming. So it's sort of like I'm sitting on about three or four projects that I think could realistically keep me employed for about five, six years. And the fruits of that can be five, six, 10 more. So ideally for me is creating a path for me to continue to grow as an actor, but to have a source that I can sort of tap into. And as I'm tapping into that source, it's a close, circle of work that I have, say, in this corner, that will spin out of control and create another small circle of work with a producer or with a particular director who's also kind of on their way up or continuing and staying on top to their journey where they're now trusting me to continue to be part of their journey as well. And it's all like this revolving circle, revolving different little circles that continue to go around and they continue to kind of feed into themselves. So I'd love to direct one day, 
but I'd love to be part of a production. I'd love to be able to have the financial freedom to say, hey, so now as a producer in this, I am going to hand over the reins of production and not only can I produce this, but now I'm going to be acting in this or doing the work in this. And maybe if it's an episodic, I'd love to direct one or two little episodes. So it's sort of like that continuing to grow within this industry and to kind of get myself into as many things creatively as possible, mainly in directing and producing, but always, always keeping my focus on the acting because that's priority for me. And all these other elements that I think that I want to incorporate into my career would just serve to make me a better actor. So ideally, that is what I'm working towards, right? I love that. That's what I'm focusing in on. And I just want to be ready. I want to be prepared because you hear people say all the time that they have this work and they have this and they have that. It's not always worth, you know, it's not always, let's face it, you know, I myself have attached myself to things in the past that were not good. And I simply did it just because there was nothing else. Right. As you grow, you let certain things go and you move to better ones. Right. It's easier to spot the things like, am I doing this because there's nothing else going on? Or am I doing this because it really means something to me because I want to bring this value that I have within me to this project? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And with just being that ongoing role model in your family for your daughters to know that yes, it's good to have fun and it's good to enjoy your teens, but at the same time to have that vision and to have something to work towards. What would you like to say for those who are listening, who have young children, who have even older children that they want to make sure that they instill this guidance in? Now, as of late, I think that we bombard kids with a lot of different words and a lot of things. We bombard them with messaging. And I've come to the realization that, you know, they're not always going to be ready to receive that message. As of late, what I'm trying to do is model my behavior more. It's more about actions than words. You know, we have to be disciplinarians. We have to set rules and we have to set boundaries. But I think it's really, for me, as of late, it's more about modeling my behavior and making sure that everything that I ask of them is something that I'm doing myself. And it's not always easy to do. We can't always be in that mode where we're going to be, you know, follow my lead type of situation there. I mean, we have to be present and we have to be really persistent, making sure that you can't let them stray away too, too far. But I think lately it's consumed me. It's something that it's my greatest responsibility, you know, career or everything else aside, you know, this is one job that I cannot fail. And sometimes you put yourself in a situation where you compromise yourself a lot because of that. And you can't do that either. So I guess my advice would be to model your behavior, to have patience, to deliver that message in a very inefficient way, succinct, without much anger, if that's the emotion that's governing that type of message or excitement. You have to sort of be even keel with them and thorough and celebrate their wins, you know, highlight the things that you got to highlight focus on the good times, and focus on being present with them, you know, as much as possible. I'm getting away from the idea of being so much the disciplinary and more of a, not a friend, but a person that they can come to. Even in a moment where they may need redirecting, I'm going to continue to redirect, but I want to try to figure out a way to do it in a better way, just because we end up wasting a lot of time sometimes. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's going to help a lot of our listeners for sure, especially the ones who are pursuing a creative path or who might be pursuing entrepreneurship or creating their online programs or creating a coaching program. Yes. There's a lot of focus, I would say, to bring our best to that while at the same time wanting to be that incredible role model, like you said, and guiding without stepping too much into the friend zone. Yes. With your own children so that they still feel like they could come to you, but they also know that what you say is going to matter and help shape them. So you're doing an incredible job. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. You're such an inspiration and you are so down to earth. And I'm so thankful that you did the podcast with me. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Jay. Appreciate you. I appreciate you so much. And I would love to leave our listeners with this incredible quote. True happiness comes from the joy of deeds well done. 
the zest of creating things new. Antoine de Saint Exuberi. So just to recap this awesome guest episode with Berto from his influential parents and grandmas in Puerto Rico to instill the positive values of being a role model for his brothers from watching ESPN, Scholastic Sports America to following in his mother's footsteps and coming to America to fulfill his passion in sports to getting accepted to Fordham University on a scholarship for football and then transitioning his interest to the arts in the entertainment world, stepping into his role as an actor. From working on his recent recurring role, Castillo, in the upcoming DC HBO Max series, Penguin, aka Boss, starring Colin Farrell, to his roles that he's best known for as Lorenzo Tejada in the Star series, Power Book 2, Ghost, opposite Mary J. Blige, with an incredible cast, including Method Man, and also his very well-known role where it all started as Caesar in the Netflix hit series, Orange is the New Black. Berto, you are such an inspiration for myself and for those tuning in. I hope that you all feel a sense of hope and encouragement and feel inspired to step up to your true passions and live life with this incredible value of being truthful to yourself and what interests you. Berto, I love you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, I appreciate it. I love you too, dear. Can't wait to see you again, Jake. Me too. Thanks for this. Absolutely. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Uber Savvy Life and Biz podcast. That was awesome. We appreciate you. Stay committed to your vision, take consistent action, and know that great things are on the other side of that door. Because remember, only you hold the key to unlock your dream life. So why not start today? I'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Can I just say you're awesome. You just finished an episode of the Uber Savvy Life and Biz podcast. If you like this episode, feel free to leave a nice review and rate it five stars if you found it helpful. But if not, please don't rate it four stars. Just ignore this part. However, if you did like it, make sure you share it with a friend who may find some value in the topics discussed today. Be sure to share it with them because you never know who you could uplift. Also, if you want more, check out the show notes in the description, which would include any links that may have been mentioned in this episode. Are you still listening? Are you waiting for a blooper reel? That'd be a really fun idea to throw in the times. But seriously, are you tired of foggy mornings? Go to jadeellison.com to grab your ultimate caffeine-free boost to supercharge your mornings for success. That's right, your empowered morning mindset checklist. Y'all, great day is just a thought away. Okay, cool. So don't hang up. This is what we're going to do. You mm-hmm. good. First of all, that was Thank awesome. You. Thank You're amazing. You. Thank, You're such a good storyteller. You. We could wait until your microwave is done. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Do you need to, like, finish? Eat. Eat. No. I, don't, I want you to take a moment to eat, honestly. It's if you're obviously fucking hungry, if you're going to eat something, Literally. did you eat chew? They were like the little, they look like Oreos. They were like really small ones. Are you moving around? Don't do that. Are you ready? Are you ready to have fun? Let's, Let's have fun. rock. Let's, Let's have, have fun. some fun. Are you ready? And you remember where to look here. Make sure all your notifications are turned off, Berto. Yeah, oh, everything is on Do Not Disturb. I don't want anyone messing with me when I'm with Jade, so. Okay. This is it. All right. Awesome. Okay. Do you need to drink water before I start? I'm good. There you go. Thank you, dear. Absolutely. We'll talk soon. Don't hang up yet. Yeah. Absolutely. We'll definitely talk soon.